for today is this is a book launch, so it's, it's slightly different from our normal seminar uh, proceedings. So uh, I'm going to say a bit uh, about the book uh, and just introduce it to you, give a sense of, of what it's about um, and, and its structure. Um, and then I'm after doing the warm up act, I'm going to pass over to the, the main event, uh, who is uh, Professor Crawford Gribben, uh, who is the author of the book and who's going to talk a little bit about uh, the principal themes um, and uh, allegedly tell a few jokes as well. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, and then we'll have the opportunity for anyone either in the room or online to, to ask um, a few questions. Um, so we can take those either from the floor uh, or if you want to digitally raise your hand if you're online or um, uh, type into the text box uh, any questions you want to ask. Uh, we'll take it forward that way. So let's, uh, let's move on without, uh, without any further uh, delay. Um, so um, today we're, we're uh, gathered uh, here and also wherever you are uh, to celebrate um, the, the, the uh, publication of The Rise and Fall of Christian Ireland, a uh, very handsomely produced book. Here it is, uh, published by Oxford University Press um, and um, competitively priced. Uh, for those of you in the room, uh, there are a few copies for sale at the back and we do have some flyers with a discount code. I'll type the discount code into the chat um, for anybody who wants that remotely uh, a bit later on uh, as well. So a little bit about, uh, about the book, which I've, I've had the great pleasure of, of reading uh, over the last uh, last week. Um, Crawford will probably tell, I'm tell me I'm completely wrong in a minute, which is absolutely fine, but um, a little bit about the genesis of the, of the book. Um, so a number of years ago, I, I um, asked Crawford um, if he'd be able to give a talk to our, our Irish Studies summer school students on the subject of an introduction to religion in Ireland uh, with a brief that he should assume that the students would be arriving probably jet lagged uh, with little or no prior knowledge of Irish history or Irish culture. Uh, so it's kind of straightforward <laughs> to ask someone to, to take on. It goes without saying, of course, um, that he, he rose to the challenge with his characteristic good humour and professionalism. Um, and it was a privilege for me uh, to be able to sit in on that class. I wasn't um, kind of peeking over your shoulder or anything. I was genuinely interested. Um, and um, and to, to, to learn uh, new, new things about the history of religion in Ireland uh, to me, uh, and also to see the students so engaged um, and respond so positively. And um, the, the brief um, I, I, I gave him, I think, uh, exposed, I think, something of an absence in the literature. Um, for amid the plethora of academic material on religion in Ireland in its various incarnations and crises uh, over the past and present, it's difficult to point the student or the interested non-specialist reader to any text that uh, attempts successfully to offer a survey of that phenomenon so central to Irish experience over the centuries, written from the context of its present uh, largely self-induced travails. Now that absence has now been filled, I think, admirably and engagingly by Crawford's book, The Rise and Fall of Christian Ireland, published last month by Oxford University Press, the launch of which, of course, we're celebrating today. By its nature, the book covering two millennia of history has to be succinct at some 220 pages of text, accessible and at the same time academically robust, a task which demands extraordinary skills of compression, synthesis and communication from its author. Crawford, I'm sure, as, as, as many or most of you will know, comes to this task with an already, by modern scholarly terms, remarkable range of expertise, from radical Protestant religious movements in 17th century Britain and Ireland, through the theology of the English Puritan divine John Owen, the currents of transatlantic religious exchange between 1600 and 1800, the dispensationalist millenarianism, so I managed not to trip up over it, as I usually do, of J.N. Darby and his followers, from the 19th century onwards, brethren histories and the apocalyptic and survivalist strands of radical evangelicalism in contemporary American culture. Throughout his work, Crawford has taken an interdisciplinary approach, combining historical and theological scholarship with literary, literary analysis. Yet even from this broad foundation, the challenges here were immense. The chronological range extends not just to the now nearly 1600 years of Ireland's Christian era, now perhaps coming to an end, but in, in its introduction looks further back into the religious cultures that preceded it in the prehistoric millennia, 
elements of which survived or were incorporated into later Christian forms and structures and into folklore, uh, which survives as we, we read from the book into areas of mid-antrum right up until the, until the present. The text offers not just an ecclesiastical but a political narrative, explicitly on the grounds that the histories of the state and its challengers and the churches have been intimately interrelated on the island since the fifth century and cannot be separated out not least if the recent and continuing sudden onset secularization of Irish society is to be understood. Coming himself personally, as he tells us in the preface, from the religious world of Northern Brethrenism and specializing as he has done in the history of Puritanism and Evangelicalism, there are additional challenges of writing the history of what was for most of its history exclusively and subsequently a majority Catholic Christianity on the island. A task I think Crawford has addressed here with much sensitivity and insight, and with a critical edge that is that is applied equally to Catholic and Protestant positions over time. The book is structured chronologically over five chapters and a conclusion that addresses losing faith in Ireland. And the potentially new pathways for religious belief and practice emerging from the current crisis. The chapter titles reflect a dominant theme for each period. Conversions addresses the earlier but obscure mission of Palladius and the better known one of Patrick, stressing the gradual and complex nature of conversion and the development of a system of monasteries which became the, the laboratories in which an Irish Christian culture was developed and from which it was disseminated, which both connected Ireland to European ways of thinking but also gave rise to the first conception of an Irish national identity. Foundation, foundations covers the medieval centuries, from Columbanus's mission of the sixth century, always a controversial issue here at Queen's, to the revival of a modern Catholicism in the ethnically divided but ecclesiastically unified cult context of the later Middle Ages. Despite bloody internal divisions in which the clergy were often complicit, Scandinavian incursions and settlement and the shock of English invasion and the partial colonization from the 12th century, the book suggests the church ended this period in robust good health and, and uh, enjoying renewal, at least in comparison with many other parts of Northern and Western Europe. The next chapter addresses the general failure of the Reformation in Ireland, leading to Protestantism on the island, being the product mostly of conquest and transplantation rather than conversion. And its adherents demonstrated little interest in conversion or indeed winning hearts and minds until at least the 19th century. While the absence of religious pluralism, at least until the development of Enlightenment ideas in the later 18th century, was not unusual in Europe, Ireland was distinguished by the fact that the dictum Cuis Regio Eus Religio did not apply due to, due to sustained, um, uh, both due to Catholic resistance and the formation of a distinct dissenting Presbyterian religious culture in the North, which was reinforced by establishment exclusivity. The next chapter, Revivals, covers the period from the re-establishment of the Ancien Regime confessional state, following Cromwell's experiment in Protestant-only toleration, to the evangelical revivals and ultramontane devotional revolution that characterized religious experience by the second half of the 19th century. Crawford suggests that the attempt to create an exclusive Anglican Christian Ireland after the Boyne was not inevitable, but a critical failure of imagination that established pathways that led both to the failed revolution of 1798, the Union and the polarization and conversionist warfare of the 19th century. The century saw the, that century saw the consolidation of Protestant and Catholic blocs in Ireland with strongly interconnected political commitments leading to them, as Crawford describes it, to gear up, gearing up to, to fight for their versions of Christian Ireland. The next chapter, Troubles, deals with these conflicts which became intrinsically tied up with the Irish Revolution and state formation in both the Irish Free State and Northern Ireland in the 20th century, reflecting on both sides what D.P. Moran characterised as the battle of two civilizations, and leading to the marginalisation or subordination of religious minorities in the successor states and the exclusion of alternative positions. If this neo-confessionalism was more marked in the Irish Free State, and Crawford uses uh, John Lavery's painting of the blessing of the colours uh, of the Irish Free State by the Archbishop of Dublin in 1922 to emblematise this, albeit never complete and weakening by the 1960s, it was less visible, but nonetheless deeply entrenched also in the North. 
Indeed, Crawford quotes ATQ Stewart as asserting that the troubles of the 1960s to 90s erupted uh, uh, or might be read as, in essence, a conflict between two religious cultures intrinsically intertwined with rival national identities. And that any move beyond this would require a cultural revolution. If this was gradually gaining ground to, uh, uh, by the 1990s, its acceleration from that point would presage the end of Christian Ireland. So this leads us to the, to the conclusion. At once the most personal uh, and uh, with its projections about potential futures and the most speculative section of the book. It begins with a summary of the extraordinary series of scandals besetting the Catholic Church in the wake of the Bishop Casey affair. In the early 1990s, scandals which escalated from the revelation of personal feelings and hypocrisies to the dam burst of exposure of systemic and large scale abuse of women and children across the institutional structures of the church and the obstinate refusal of the church to acknowledge this. As the church's moral authority collapsed, the Irish state, so long complicit in its control of social affairs, rapidly distanced itself. Crawford quotes Enda Kenny at length to indicate the, the extent to which this was rhetorically asserted as reflecting an alternative moral vision, and then follows up by official, then followed up by official inquiries leading to the Ryan and Murphy reports in 2009, more controver and more controversially, the Mother and Baby Home report of last year. If these revelations and the state's responses signaled at the end of Catholic Ireland in the Republic, giving an, uh, an edge, <coughs> giving an, uh, uh, sorry, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, giving an edge to longer term trends towards social secularization. Such forces also operated in the, in the north, albeit in a less dramatic way. The Protestant churches on both sides of the borders, border played their part too. Uh, and, um, and here the end of the troubles has promoted the dissipation of the religious blocks that the conflict helped solidify. While similar generational shifts have, have increased support for, for more liberal social policies on homosexuality and abortion. Religiously oriented identity politics have not, as we know, entirely disappeared in the North, to say the least, but they are losing ground and opening up other alternatives on this part of the island as well. Moving from narrative to analysis, Crawford suggests that this collapse may not necessarily be a bad thing, even from a Christian perspective. Church attempts to dominate and control the people of the island evident from the interrelations of church and state from the early medieval period on, can be seen as having undermined rather than promoted the Christian faith and associated it with an authoritarianism and state worship alien to Christianity's original precepts and example. This opens a discussion of what forms a chastened and reflective, reflective Christianity might take in a post-Christian post Ireland and what it might still be able to offer to an Irish society where public opinion has become susceptible to the marketization of ethics by neoliberal capital and the so and social media driven superficiality. Some of this response he speculates might involve adopting perhaps both a corrupt, uh, sorry, adopting perhaps both a medieval ideal and principles held within brethrenism, a new monasticism of, of withdrawal from a corrupt society to live a more moral life. But it might also involve the seizure of opportunities created by the collapse of the old to imagine and find new kinds of religious expression. Rather than offering a lament for a now clearly lost Christian Ireland constructed on establishments, confessionalism and exclusive dogmas, the book closes with an optimistic note from a spiritual perspective that after the failure of religious nationalism, what looks like irremediable failure might actually be a second chance for the old Augustines might point to a heavenly, still point to a heavenly kingdom as new Patricks shape the rise of another Christian Ireland. So whether you're personally religious or not, I think there's much to recommend in this extremely stimulating and beautifully written book. Given it, its length, uh, it, it isn't and it can't be comprehensive or encyclopedic, it doesn't intend to be, but it is, I think, an essay on where we have been, where we are now, and offers questions that will certainly stimulate debate as to where we may be going. And I strongly recommend it to you all. So that's the warm up act. Thank you all for, for, for listening. I'm going to pass over. I'm going to pass over to, to Crawford now, who has um, some slides that he's going to talk to.
So uh, we're going to try and find where we put slides. Has anyone here ever used Teams before? Click on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and then reload it. So just window. And then that's here. Is it? Yeah, if you double click on it. That's PDF, no, it's PowerPoint. Oh, oh, sorry. But I did have it open. Try down there. Uh, can people see that? Good. Can, can anyone can anyone at home see that? Can anyone just turn on their mic and tell us where you can see the, the slide? No. You can't. Okay. <laughs> I suspected no. that was the case. Okay. No video. Just, just bear with us for a second. We did have the slides up and we seem to have lost them again. So what I'm going to do is just go out of, of um, uh, well, I'll just, just share, maybe share the screen. Uh, oh, hang on, is that it? Well, that's not your post the next one. No, it's not that one, sorry. Sorry, just bear with us for a second. This this is where- It will be worth it. It will. <laughs> Oh no, that's that's completely the wrong one. Like <laughs> no, it's, it's a really it's a really good lecture that one, but that's definitely not what we're looking for. Um, so, that's a PDF, isn't it? Yeah. There was a PowerPoint that down. Was Yeah. I should try that one. Okay. So it's called. I think it's oh, sorry. Launch. The book launch. Where is it? Where is there? You can always try sharing the screen and then find Yeah, it. okay, we'll do that. Yeah, okay. Okay. Maybe summer school was never like this, would it? We we didn't have to no, that's not it either. Sorry. Where, where is it? Um maybe it's just shut down, maybe no. Give us speed drive. OK, we think we've solved the problem. So if someone could just again shout out from the ether to see whether you can now see the slides, that would be great. Yep, we can see them now. Perfect, That's thank great. you. Thank Good. You. Right, well, um, <laughs> thank you very much, Peter, uh, for such a kind um, welcome to that book. I'm going to speak a little bit more about your responsibility for it later on. Um, but as Peter mentioned uh, in that very detailed um, summary of the book's content, hopefully uh, not so detailed you don't want to buy it. It is, in fact, available for sale at the back. Um, but as Peter mentioned, this is really a book about two things. It's a book fundamentally about how Christianity shaped what it meant to be Irish. And secondly, it's a book about how the Irish shaped Christianity. Um, the, the book does attempt to do this in a grand scale. There's strengths and weaknesses to that kind of um, framing. Uh, maybe speak a little bit more about that uh, in due course. But fundamentally, um, that, that is really what the project is all about. Uh, I'm always drawn to this picture in the Ulster Museum, Stan La Ahar by uh, Sean Keating, uh, about which Eliza McKee has written uh, so nicely in Ulster Museum website, but it's a, it's a picture that reminds me that the Irish experience of Christianity has often been an experience of saying goodbye. And in some ways, um, preparing this uh, project was a, a kind of way of doing that, a, a, a way of thinking about what there has been uh, and what might need to be said goodbye to as a consequence. One of the, the kind of great existential questions that I think that many of us have been thinking about over the last 20 years is the question of how religious culture that was 1500 years in the making managed to collapse, um, not quite to the point of disappearance, but to collapse certainly in any authoritative way within the space of a couple of decades. And I've put up in the slide there a uh, very famous picture of John Paul II um, attending one of the, the many gatherings in which 2.5 million people, a, a third of uh, the southern state's population, um, came, came to meet him. The contrast there, of course, is the slide beneath. 2018, the visit of Pope Francis to Phoenix Park, um, once the site of one of the great triumphs of the John Paul II uh, visit, but now in 2018, um, even in a situation in which its organisers had, had limited uh, the spaces available to cope with decreasing demand, even in that situation, um, really displaying uh, how few people 
were willing to, to make the effort to come and see him. So that, that really was the, the question that, that haunted me a little bit as I was writing this, how a religious culture that was so long in the making could so suddenly disappear. And, and yet, I suppose one of the things that, that I became very aware of uh, as I wrote the book was that that's not a new question, that had we been meeting in the fifth century, we'd have been asking exactly the same question, but it would have been framed differently. How's a religious culture that's many thousands of years in the making disappearing so quickly? And what, what are the kinds of effects uh, that that will have? Of course, it's also important to, to recognise that in the midst of this long history of failure, this long goodbye, uh, there are many excellent uh, examples uh, and inspirations that we can follow. Um, this being one of them. Um, as, as Peter mentioned, uh, one of the, the complicating uh, factors in writing this book was realising that in some senses I was part of the story I was describing. Um, growing up, I suppose, in quite a marginal way in relation to the long history of Christian Ireland, uh, both in Scotland to County Antrim parents, uh, which was an interesting experience, not least because we were, in fact, uh, the only family in our housing estate to grow cabbages in the front lawn, <laughs> which, you know, which was an acceptable eccentricity until uh, the bus route to school uh, was rerouted past our house. Um, but uh, not only geographically, but also, I suppose, denominationally, and as Peter mentioned, I grew up in a family. My parents belonged to a religious group called the Plymouth Brethren. Uh, the Brethren is religious movement, Terence Brown, the cultural historian, has suggested, are perhaps the Protestant group most affected by the situation of 19th century Ireland um, in ways that we could maybe uh, explain in a different in, in, in a different context. But they're mostly known for people who left them, Alistair Crowley, most unfortunately, <laughs> uh, but also Edmund Goss. Edmund Goss, mm. uh, the late 19th century literary critic who wrote famously of his troubled relationship with his father, the Victorian naturalist Philip Goss. Uh, and I'm always drawn to this quotation from his book, Father and Son, that childhood in Plymouth Brethren can be understood only by scholars of the 17th century or stout Protestants from County Antrim. <laughs> and I just leave that quotation up there uh, for absolutely no biographical reason whatsoever. <laughs> However, as uh, Peter well knows, seeing what's about to come next on the screen, the, the Brethren are also known uh, for declaiming noisily, waving small books in the air, uh, at baffled strangers in public places. So you may well ask, how does that skill map into academia? Uh, it's an excellent question. Um, well, uh, as Peter mentioned uh, in his presentation, the, the, the genesis of this book um, really was in the Irish Studies Summer School. And so if this book had any kind of sacramental life at all, Peter would be its godfather, which is why it's very important that, that he is beside me here at the kind of electronic font uh, at the front of the room. But um, as Peter mentioned, um, he invited me. In fact, he's very polite. Actually, it was instructed. He instructed <laughs> me to come along to Irish Studies Summer School to do a presentation on something that no one had ever written about, uh, which, well, one person had written about, uh, Michael Staunton at UCD, a very fine book covering Irish Christianity up to about 2000, uh, a book that unfortunately got out of print, and of course, missing the post-2000 period, missing perhaps the most complicated and difficult part of that story. Uh, and so year on year as I came to the Irish Studies Summer School, my PDF got bulkier and bulkier and more and more text heavy uh, until it seemed just more logical to convert it into a Word document. Uh, and um, the, the present project became uh, the fruit of that. But in addition to Peter's inspiration, um, I also drew some inspiration from David Armitage, who's part of our community of historians here at HAP as well, who published a number of years ago a book called The History Manifesto, along with Joe Gildy. And this is a book that argues for the importance of big scale historical projects. Typically, when we do our PhDs or um, projects, we, we look at quite closely defined um, themes or, or contexts or periods and we try to trace change over time in a very short period. One of the things Armitage and Gould are arguing in that book is that we really need to think about the biggest possible context for some of our projects. And uh, as, I, as I try to turn uh, a history of Christianity in Ireland into a long-term history, uh, it occurred to me that it was a story that was perhaps too easily shaped. Um, Peter's gone through the, the, the outline of the, the contents page and it's a little bit neat, uh, and I wonder, I've never been quite happy in my own mind whether that's 
an acceptable neatness or not. And yet, as I look back on the history of this, I, I can see very obviously conversions and foundations. I can see very obviously two failed Reformation attempts, one in the 12th, one in the 16th century. I can see in the 19th century two successful parallel revival movements, and then the 20th century some of their political and religious consequences of partition, competing religious nationalisms, and so on. And then, of course, the sudden onset secularization is one of those moments of um, unexpected um, twists, I suppose, uh, that, that might not have been so easily predicted until um, very recently before it. So I suppose, in a, in a sense, this is a project or, or a, an essay in long term history. Um, as, as I as I think about the book, I, I can see that it has breadth. Um, I can also see that it doesn't have an awful lot of depth, uh, and maybe that's something I need to go and um, ask David Armitage about when he next visits yeah. campus. How is it possible to combine um, both of those? But I want to say thanks finally um, by um, again uh, highlighting Peter's contribution to, to, to the making of this project. It really wouldn't have happened um, uh, had he not um, encouraged it to happen. And I want to pay uh, special attention to several colleagues, many of whom are here today, um, although Maria I think has just left, um, but Ian is here uh, and um, others are not, others have left us. Liz and Sparky uh, most recently, um, Andrew's not able to be here, Salvador, uh, Maynooth, all of these colleagues are colleagues who helped me with this in very practical and real ways. Um, correcting, as Ian will probably testify if you give him a third glass of wine, many, many errors, especially related to the Cromwellian uh, incursion uh, and, and, and um, whatever the, the weaknesses of the books, uh, I, I know it's a lot stronger for the time and expertise that these colleagues contributed to it. I am um, mentioning Salvador, Liz, Sparky, Ian, Andrew and Marie. I put dot, dot, dot at the end uh, and that's simply because it's, it's not a finished list, it's an unfinished list. And I'm conscious of many friends here in the room, colleagues, uh, friends and colleagues, not necessarily two separate categories, <laughs> um, but um, many colleagues here in the room and elsewhere tuning in as well. I can see their names on the screen uh, and I'm grateful to, to so many colleagues, students and friends for, for really helping me understand so much of the rise and fall of Christian Ireland. So thank you very much. Crawford, thank you so much um, for that. that. That's absolutely perfect. Um, what we'll do is just close down, hopefully without any further technical problems, the slideshow, and um, you're happy to take a few questions. By all means, yeah. 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 So anybody in the audience, just put your hand up if you want to ask a question, or anyone online. Well, the answer um, to the first question, Peter, is it's actually cheaper at the back of the room. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, I was going to type in the... Um, I was going to type in the uh, the promotion code here, so I'll I'll do that for anyone who's online. Does anyone? Does anyone? Yes, can start. Um, thank you, Mike, for that. Thanks. Thanks. Great book. Um, and this is possibly a spoiler alert, but like, when do you finish the Christian Ireland book? Because I'm just I'm conscious that I like is this a history of Irish Christianity, or is it a history of Christianity in Ireland? Because we look to you know religious orders, traditionally Irish religious orders. It's not Irish people that are in them anymore. People looked at Africa and Asia. So I was just wondering where the new migration. Yeah, yeah. Um, migration is not something that I really spoke a lot about, except in the conclusion, mm -hmm. um, where I suggest that the future of the Irish Church will be largely determined by the experience of immigration. Yeah. Um, I think that, I mean, as, as Peter said, the last chapter is completely speculative. Mm -hmm. So you know, there are footnotes, but they're you know, they're there for decoration only. Mm -hmm. um, so it, certainly in terms of Catholic experience. My sense is that the collapsing number of vacations among Irish born yeah. men into the Catholic priesthood, for example, um, will require priests to be sourced from overseas, but is already requiring priests to be sourced from overseas. And one of the consequences of that, I suspect, is that um, they will bring with them a slightly more conservative version of Catholicism than might be the mainstream here, especially south of the border. Um, so uh, I think it's also probably true to say that um, um, the experience of coming here may may soften mm -hmm. something of that uh, um, set of commitments, mm -hmm. or it might not, but I suspect it probably will. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't think that will change the long term direction mm -hmm. of um, of religious evolution. I think it may just slow it down. Okay. Do we have any other questions from the room or or online? Yeah. Uh, Ian McBride, 
uh, recently remarked that uh, this has been sort of wandering in 20th century Ireland territory, so this is a bit of laugh. Ian McBride recently remarked that um, religion seems to have disappeared to a certain extent from histories of the Irish Revolution. Um, and the story that you're telling of uh, religious nationalism and so on seems quite different to that. Uh, as someone who normally writes about 17th century history, what was your impression of um, that, recent, that, that current historiographical field and the place of religion in it? Yeah, it's a really interesting question, Ian. Um, Fergus, or Fergal is obviously the, 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 the person to answer that properly. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's clear when when you look at Patrick Pierce, for example, I mean, I read, I read through a chunk of uh, Patrick Pierce's writing for this. I mean, he's deeply motivated by religious ideals. He really, really is. And uh, not not only religion as a kind of an external thing, but, but Catholicism as something that makes sense of Irishness. And Irishness is something that makes sense of Catholicism. And I, I, mean, I was really struck by some of his papers and, 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 and speeches where he, is, where he talks about what we might call pre-Christian Ireland, this, the, the old sagas, you know, the, the kind of the Celtic twilight collected material. And, and, and he sees that as ultimately prophetic of Christianity itself. So, you know, the Ton, for example, a, 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 you know, a child born of a, of a deity um, who, whose, whose death unites people, you know, all, all of these kind of themes. And, and he really reads um, uh, th those kinds of materials as in an almost prophetic way. It was a really striking way to approach that material, and it was very much like seventh, eighth century monks would have approached that kind of material as seeing it as prophetic of Christ, and therefore including that within the national narrative. Um, as for you know, as for modern historiography of of that period, I'm, I'm certainly not any kind of specialist. Um, there, you know, some some of the material that some of the the, the, the more fringe groups, let's say, I, I thought their religious interests had been very sensitively dealt with. Um, material on De Valera, um, I, I might not be totally up to date with the most recent stuff, but I mean, it, it seemed to me that, that in fact, that they, they were taking his religious experience and commitments pretty seriously. Um, that was my sense of it. I'm you know, by no means a subject area expert. Well, I mean, just to follow up on that, Cork, one thing to find, I guess, in that um, revolutionary period is, is a lot of revolutionaries who aren't necessarily religious use the language of religion to talk about nationalism. It's new opinions like um, Sean McDermott and so on. And, or even Pierce is a good example. And Pierce had also saw it, believes they were partly religious. But yeah, you know, just taking that Christian metaphor of redemption and yeah. sacrifice and so on, you really don't have to be religious at all for that. It's yeah. just because that's the language in which people understand these speak. Uh, concepts, but I suppose uh, um, a related point might be how did you manage to distinguish a lot of the, the, the writing of the Irish Revolution in, in recent decades is very interested in sectarianism and the extent to which violence can be explained through sectarianism. It's not interested in religion, it's interested in religion as a, as a boundary or a marker, you know, identity marker. It could be something completely else. So did you struggle with, with disentangling writing about religion from writing about identity and religion forms the market because I think that's really quite a different thing. We know that yeah. this is shorthand of troubles which you'll see in the American newspaper will be it's a religious conflict in Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plus, yeah. All sense in yeah. Yeah. Could you just summarise the question because people can't yeah, hear. Of so, yeah, so a question from Fergal McGarry asking, I suppose, essentially about how to distinguish rhetoric from commitment or religious as identity marker as opposed to um, uh, affiliation with a particular set of confessional claims, let's say. I mean, it's it's it it, it is a massive issue, isn't it? Um, I mean, the the um, I, I think you're right to point to the kind of uh, unhelpful shorthand of a lot of American journalists who do want to stylize the troubles simply as a kind of straightforward sectarian conflict. Uh, having said that, I think that would be controversially. I think that at times it might have been, um, and certainly it was for some of the people involved in it. And so, I mean, I was. I was um, greatly struck by the dissension between the official IRA and provisional IRA and the way in which the provisional IRA were still really, in those early years, apparently committed to a much older form of religious nationalism, which you know they do eventually well, quite quickly abandon. But it does seem to be a significant um, a significant player. And you've got warnings you know, printed in some of the 
Republican magazines about people moving to, to England, about the kind of godless society they're going to, going to uh, experience there. Um, but I mean, as to the bigger question, how do you identify when it's purely rhetorical or where theological ideas are being used essentially for political effect? It, it is difficult. Um, and certainly as someone who was, you know, who was never going to be able to be a subject area expert on, on any of these fields, um, uh, I, you know, I, I did very much depend upon judgments of people, um, you know, who, who were writing in the field. Uh, at proposal stage, the project was meant to be a judicious summary of the best available scholarship. Mm -hmm. uh, as time went on, it just became a summary of scholarship. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, perhaps some of the quality markers dissipated a little bit over time. But I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental question, isn't it? OK, I can see uh, Guy is waiting to ask a question. So Guy, do you want to unmute yourself? Hi, can you hear me there? Sure, yeah. Well, Crawford, congratulations. I mean, this is incredible. I still haven't seen it because it's not out in the US, but my UK copy is in the mail, I'm told, so I'll, I'll be reading it soon. Um, I'm just wondering about framing an issue as rise, of as rise and decline in terms of the teleology that's there and the inevitable end that's at the end that's waiting for us. And as you mentioned yourself, and as Peter mentioned in the short kind of preface there, that it's a story, it seems to be of constant thinking about this problem and constant crisis and reinvention all the time. So to what extent do you see the current crisis as terminal, not in the sense that a new religion can be reinvented, now, can, can be discovered now by going back to the fundamentals of early Christianity, but as part of the process of constant reinvention. And, and I'm thinking maybe because I've been reading lately, um, Daniel Hervé Leger, who wrote about religion as a chain of memory including in Europe, that secularization is, uh, is misleading. And, and who more than anybody like yourself would know that the secularization narrative and modernity narrative and the decline of religion is always misleading because America has always shown it to be misleading. So I want to just to pose that to you. Yeah, um, it's, it's a big question. Guy's asking, I suppose, really about the teleology built into the title of the book, Rise and Fall, and um, the extent to which uh, that un under, uh, under, under underestimates the extent to which religion is always in crisis uh, and, and, and always developing as a consequence. Yeah, I, th I think that's fair. I, I do comment on the teleology question, Guy. Uh, when you get your copy, you'll see that in the preface, that, that it is too simple. Uh, and yet it does, you know, it, it does, I think, reflect what I do see, uh, which is rise, decline, uh, you know, think of it in terms of birth, um, you know, life, maturity, death, uh, I mean, I suppose we can add to that, g given the topic of the book, resurrection, and uh, and try to think about the last chapter in terms of how a resurrected or renewed uh, Christian religion would look when authority structures that it's been traditionally identified with are no longer trusted. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I, I do think that the, the crisis, the perpetual sense of crisis, and of course, it's not just a religious crisis. You know, we're living through all kinds of economic, technological, political crises uh, at the moment as well. But all of these are, are festering into new kinds of religion. I mean, it's really interesting in, in, in the States. I don't know if you've got there yet, but it's really interesting in the States to see the way in which this sense of crisis is promoting a new um, or a much a, a renewed uh, Catholic integralism on the part of, of a number of quite prominent um, political scientists, lawyers, uh, Ivy League institutions, uh, who are who are really trying to repristinate um, uh, thrown on altar versions of of, of Catholic religion. Um, I can't see that taking off here, um, and obviously it's got its own challenges in the American constitutional tradition as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I think that's that, that's a great point. You know, this is is perpetual revolution, perpetual renewal. Um, but rise and fall, I mean, if Gibbon can do decline and fall, why can't Gribbon do rise and fall? <laughs> <laughs> That's really trite. Uh, I apologise, but why not? Congratulations on your job, by the way. OK, um, do we have any other questions in the, in the room? Yeah. Um, thanks, Zach. I'm looking forward to hearing your book. Sounds great. I'm just wondering, has your own uh, teaching and research on uh, apocalyptic and millennial days and um, influence this book in any way? I think about the various uh, millennial uh, frameworks in particular. 
<laughs> Thanks, Claire. Um, so Claire, Claire McNulty, uh, who's TA on the Apocalypse module, uh, <laughs> along with Lucy next door, uh, is asking whether um, um, thinking about apocalyptic narratives has fed into the sense of decline. And I would say if it's not a bad pun, inevitably. <laughs> um, yeah, inevitably. Um, yes. Um, Yes, I'm not quite sure how to answer that, but uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure that's right. I'm, I'm sure that this kind of declinism, which is such a kind of a trope uh, in conservative his, historiography at the best of times, um, you know, is man, being manufactured here as well, uh, although probably not to very good effect. OK, um, <clears throat> any other questions online? Anyone has? Anyone wants to pose anything? Either uh, through the chat box or um, by raising your hand digitally. Or anyone anyone in the room? Yes, Brian. Yeah, yeah, I mean, just to ask in your speculations at the end, I mean, are there any green shoots for, for Christianity in Ireland and where, do, where specifically do you see them? Yeah, I think there are. I think there are, but it's, it's going to be a very different um, version of Christianity from anything we've known before. I think it's very telling that the only, let's go back to the point about immigration, the only the only group, the only denomination that's growing in Ireland at the moment, as far as I'm aware, um, are the Orthodox churches. And that's obviously as a consequence of immigration from Central and Eastern Europe. Um, the, other, the other thing that I think is very interesting to observe is that if you look at census data, the category of non-belief is growing fastest in Northern Ireland in areas that are traditionally um, unionist voting areas. So let's say traditionally Protestant areas, to use all kinds of stereotypes. But traditionally Protestant areas uh, are the areas where non-belief is growing fastest. And so I think that, I mean, that poses some very interesting political problems, even as large swathes of unionism swing back to very emphatic religious politics. Um, the, the voters they are depending upon, many of them are moving exactly in the opposite way, much more progressive, socially progressive way. Uh, and it might be exactly the opposite among, let's say, traditional Catholic voters in the North, whose elected representatives are often pushing for a much more progressive social agenda than the church is willing to support. So you've got, you know, while there's secularization obviously happening everywhere, uh, I think it's, it's in producing some really interesting structural strains into politics in the north, and I think we'll we'll just have to wait and see how that pans out. But yeah, in terms of growth, Brian, I think it's the Orthodox churches that seem to be doing best. Ten years ago, you'd have said the evangelical churches, African immigrant churches, their growth seems to have plateaued. Um, if Gladys is still here, she's gone. Um, she could have helped us with that, but and that's that's my sense of it. I think. Fergal. Um, you spent a lot of time reading other surveys of a similar kind about Christianity in other countries. Have you come to any conclusions in terms of what you say is the state of um, the Irish experience? You know, is it, is it very different to other parts of Europe? It's, it's shorter than some and longer than others. I suppose that's an obvious point. Um, it's also much more coloured by a single denomination than is the case in many places elsewhere. Um, it's, um, uh, it's much as, as it's also much more disrupted politically than is the case elsewhere. So I mean, if you take Russia, for example, you've got you know, essentially a single church which unites church and state for many, many hundreds of years. You can compare that with America. We've just got this perpetual ferment of various Protestant groups competing against one another by and large. There's other religious expressions there, but you know, it's dominated by that, at least politically. You've also got very strong political Catholicism, the Democratic Party. Uh, but I mean, in, in some ways, Ireland's kind of a middle a middle house. I think what really makes the Irish experience distinct is that it, it, it plunges headlong into this sudden onset secularization, almost, almost with the exception of Father Ted, almost without anyone heralding it. And uh, that, I mean, it's that, it's that, it's the suddenness and starkness of that um, change that really strikes me. I mean, I know we hesitate to use, use the word exceptional, but it strikes me as being quite exceptional. I can't think of anywhere else that has had that kind of experience as quickly as that. Um, you know, it takes hundreds of years in England, for example, to reach a similar kind of point, and in Ireland it takes 
20 years, 25 years. A lot of people have written about that from the perspective of secularism. Yeah. You know, not particularly interested in religion. Is there something distinctive about coming at that from the perspective that you're in the long sweep of Christianity? Or do you come up with a very similar kind of explanatory framework to secularists? Yeah. Um, I'm maybe not totally on top of the secularist narrative, but I mean, look, looking at bigger ideas of secularization. I mean, I think that, you know, traditionally, of course, they're associated with the experience of Protestantism, um, within the Christian world, at least. Um, and, you know, what makes Ireland distinct is that it seems to move to the results of Protestantism without passing through a Reformation. Um, I mean, beyond that, I, I'm not really sure uh, where to go. Um, Spain in the 80s might have some current. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Post, post Franco. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Rapid secularization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same kind of authoritarian structures, yeah. perhaps. Mm -hmm. Or similar authoritarian structures. Mm -hmm. Portugal, perhaps, as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, but I suppose that what made them distinct is their, both in, Spain, in the case of Spain and Portugal, a very strong tradition of authoritarian government, yeah. which wasn't the case mm -hmm. in Ireland. Did, did we have a question from Catherine online? I thought I saw a hand go up. If you're still there, Catherine, you want to ask a question? Go ahead. Yes. Can you hear me there? Yes. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, my, thank you. Yeah, congratulations on the book. I've just finished it there and it, it, I really enjoyed it. So thank you. Um, my question was um, in relation to kind of post Christian um, Ireland, how, or do you have any suggestions of how Christianity can begin to reconcile itself um, in, in Ireland um, and kind of address these accusations of hypocrisy um, that it's kind of gained, particularly after the 20th century? Um, I know um, you, I saw Derek Skelly had um, reviewed your book. I know he's um, written. Um, on different models that perhaps the church could adopt. So I just wondered if you had any comments on, on that. Um, yeah, thanks, Catherine. So Catherine's question is about how the church, presumably mainly the Catholic church, I think is the subtext of the question, can address um, the, the kind of horrors of the last couple of decades um, as a way to build trust. And she mentions Derek Scally's book. Um, Derek Scally's book, don't know if you've read it, The Best Catholics in the World, fascinating piece of work. Um, uh, and he proposes in that book that um, German ways of becoming reconciled, well, how, how do you put it, the, the ways in which German institutions responded to the Second World War and the Holocaust are, are models that could be adopted here. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question, Catherine, I suppose partly because different churches have different experience of this. And it's also worth remembering that while denominations are very strong, uh, whether it's the Catholic Church or whether it's you know the Church of Ireland and the Presbyterian denomination uh, in Ireland, um, there's also a lot of independent churches, all of whom have got their own trials and tribulations uh, and and dif different ways of different things to come to terms with, and different structures through which they can come to terms with them. I mean, Scally's idea, or what, I mean, he's proposed several ideas, but what, one of his ideas of a kind of um, museum, a travelling museum. Um, for example, I think could, could, could be really useful. Um, but it, it, in a sense, anything that's done is symbolic, isn't it? Uh, it's, it repentance of any kind is symbolic. Um, the news last week that um, one of the dioceses here in the north was committing to, what was it, 2.5 million pounds, I forget exactly the, the sum, um, w was also symbolic. Um, but I'm not really sure what, what else can be done apart from some kind of symbolic um gesture uh, you know the the number of people involved is so vast um the, the 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 horrors that have been inflicted upon people are so serious and the effects so long lasting that it's just it's just impossible really to know what a wise way of proceeding is i think certainly everyone should do a lot of listening and maybe as a consequence of listening um those who are survivors uh, and indeed those who are um, victimizers could be um, helped or could help to understand what an appropriate way forward might be. But it's a massive question, Catherine, and uh, a massive social issue um, that will take generations, I think, really to work through. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Catherine. Uh, do we have any other questions from anyone? Not seeing any other hands uh, go up or, or people waving in the room. So I'm pretty sure someone organised reception. I think I think maybe that may, maybe time to move on to the next stage of, of proceedings. Um, sorry to all of those of you who are joining us online that you can't uh, can't be here with us. Um, but now I think it's time uh, probably to say goodbye to you. But perhaps we might all thank Crawford for his presentation and for answering the questions before we move on to that. And also, just to remind you, uh, we do have a, I feel like a more conventional seminar next Monday at 4.30 and we'll be doing it again in person and online. And our speaker next Monday is Dr. Katrina Goldstone, uh, who will be speaking on the subject of, of loyal and cosmopolitan Irishmen, question mark, Leslie Dakin and Michael Sayers, Irish Jewish writers negotiating identity and politics in the 1930s and 1940s. So you're very welcome to, to join us. Uh, we have um, those, of you, those of, of you who want to join us online, we already have uh, an event bright set up for that. So just uh, register and, um, and we'll send you the link to participate. Thank you all for, for joining us. We're going to kind of switch off the technology now and move over to the other side of the room and have a drink. So thank you. Thank you, Peter.